So Martin laid a nice foundation, I think, in some of their talks as well, so I'm kind of glad I'm at the end. Um, this is more of a case study type project rather than your kind of replicated field plot type of study. Um, and uh, we conducted this as a cooperative project between uh, Washington State University, Department of Ecology, and actually had some funding from our Washington State Dairy Federation as well. So um, some of the previous work that we conducted uh, was done, actually we started about over 10 years ago on this, this same field. And previous research uh, that we conducted uh, demonstrated that when manure nitrogen was applied at rates greater than needed for grass uptake, uh, the excess nitrogen in the soil in the form of nitrate nitrogen uh, certainly leached uh, shallow groundwater. And that's one of the pieces about this particular study is we were able to look at the shallow groundwater nitrate um, in this particular county. And we do have uh, pretty high rainfall during the October through uh, March time period. So that nitrogen that's not taken up uh, by mid-fall uh, is, is highly susceptible to the loss to shallow groundwater. And in the prior study, it was evidence that tillage had a major impact on the amount of nitrate that was in the soil that then subsequently was available for either use by the crop or if the crop wasn't there for, for loss to uh, shallow groundwater. So um, the study that I'm going to talk about today will actually start out here at the end of where this plot is, but just to give you an idea of the history, um, the whole 22-acre field had been tilled in, uh, in 2004, and we saw this big influx of nitrate into soil and subsequently into shallow groundwater, and it declined to where it went below this uh, 10 ppm per milligram per liter uh, MCL by uh, approximately 2006, and then we had some other you know, events and so forth here, but uh, we do see, and so we think a lot of this was just due to the mineralization of the organic matter that was there from historical manure applications. So, so the purpose of this particular study, uh, we had an opportunity, the, the, the producer was going to uh, uh, reestablish this particular grass seeding, and um, so we asked if we had the opportunity to go in and either look at a um, minimal uh, minimal tillage situation or conventional tillage where it would all get uh, completely ripped up. So it's two, two year study began in 2009, and again we wanted to look at the fate and transport of nitrogen. Uh, we, we still had these shallow groundwater nitrate uh, monitoring wells there and kind of had the team in place. So, um, so we characterized nitrogen input outputs, underlying groundwater nitrate concentration, and then uh, ultimately with the goal of trying to be able to recommend uh, some best practices for producers. So um, all of you are probably familiar with this nitrogen cycle, but we've got nitrate ammonium, uh, we're looking at denitrification, we're looking at leaching, we're looking at volatilization. So um, the, uh, what's in green here were the primary things we were monitoring. We also did monitor leaching. Uh, we didn't do any estimates of uh, ammonia uh, or any of the uh, nitrous or nitrous oxide losses. So, but this is a, the complex system we're trying to get a, a grip on. So the particular study site, uh, this is the Canadian border here, um, and uh, we're located right in here, so pretty much about uh, a mile from the Canadian border. And um, this is an aerial view of the study site, so this is it here. Um, and where these yellow dots are is where the shallow groundwater monitoring wells are located. And if you take a cross-section view, you get an idea of what um, the aquifer looks like. you got sea level here, so you've got this uh, superficial, shallow um, aquifer here. You've got the semi-confining unit here, and then you're down in the bedrock, so you get an idea in relation to sea level. Um, so the study site was right in here, so we're about 150 feet or so above of sea level at that particular point, but fairly wet, particularly during the winter. Okay, so this is a study site, so we had uh, conventional till, so you can completely till and see the grain had been reseeded, and this was the uh, minimal till gone in. So the idea was, could we go in and do a minimal till practice versus a conventional, uh, conventional till and, and minimize then some of the organic matter that would be subsequently available for making uh, nitrate, and then if it's not caught by the crop, would it um, be lost to uh, shallow groundwater nitrate. So we took half the field into uh, conventional and half into uh, what we considered minimal till. 
Um, at the time of manure application, this was typical kind of equipment that was used. We took uh, samples of manure, so we had an idea of uh, what kind of nitrogen application rates. Uh, this is how we obtain our grass silage samples, our grass samples that subsequently the grass was put in for silage. Use these two by two uh, frames um, and harvested the mature off there. Uh, and then this is a picture of the, uh, the monitoring well with the different equipment. Um, some of these samples were, were measured um, at, at that exact time. So things like temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, and so forth with the, the flow cell assembly. <clears throat> so uh, back to a few more details. So in 2009, after the grass was reseeded, the conventional till grass was harvested two times. Again, so that's all ripped up. So you gotta wait for that new seeding to come into place. So it was only only able to get two harvests that year. In the minimal till side, we were able to get three three harvests. So we did gain one extra harvest with the minimal till. But due to a poor stand established in the minimal till area, um, it was reestablished, or there was again some uh, treatment to that in 2010. So we unfortunately kind of lost the opportunity to maybe see had this minimal till stuck and given a really good stand, uh, what things would have looked like. But this was on a, a commercial dairy, so we wanted to look at practical conditions. In 2010, then, the conventional till uh, was harvested four times, while the uh, minimal till was only harvested twice. So we gained an extra harvest in 2009, but we lost a couple in 2010 because of extra tillage. So a little bit of the data, this is the manure application in pounds uh, per acre, um, and this is total nitrogen uh, applied. So th this was an application in this, uh, both this March and May were both before uh, there was uh, any land practices. So <clears throat> again, on the minimal till, because there was established stand there, we were able to get some extra manure on during uh, uh, July and August of 2009. Whereas for the conventional till, because that seeding had established as well, we didn't get um, manure on until in uh, early October. And then again, there was some on the, manure, uh, on the minimal till. So in 2010, um, you see that similar, uh, well, exactly the same time of application, exactly the same application rates uh, for 2010. Now we're getting a bit more of the details. So we're look, now looking at cumulative dry matter of the forage. So now we're looking for forage growth. And um, so in 2009, uh, we had a first cutting that was taken in May prior to the seeding. And therefore, it's shown on this graph, it was not included in any of the cumulative totals. So this was, we had about a 1.9 and about 2.1 ton per acre with two different sides. Um, with minimal till, we were able to get uh, almost another ton uh, in early June. And then uh, about 1.4, uh, 1.4 tons for the uh, conventional, and then 1.6 for the uh, minimal till. And then we were at about 2.4 to 2.5 by uh, early September 2009. So then in uh, in 2010, because the minimal till, the producer didn't feel like it was a well-established stand, uh, was sprayed with Roundup and then reseeded, and um, so the first cutting wasn't collected until June of that year, so uh, we'll see that here at about uh, two times, whereas the conventional flow was at 3.4 on the 1st of May, and 5.3 on the uh, 1st of June. So a pretty good growth, pretty good growing conditions there in 2010. And then again, about 7 ton yield here, or these are cumulative tons, uh, excuse me, and we're up to about four here, and then by the end of uh, 2010, we're up at a cumulative nine, and we're up at a cumulative six. So that's yield, dry matter yield. If we look at the nitrogen then, 2009, again, the first cutting was in May, was prior to receding. Um, so again, we look at these accumulatives, and for the conventional and minimal till, they were fairly similar then in, in 2009. But we do begin to see that advantage for the conventional in 2010 because the, the minimal till got another uh, set of uh, land practice treatments. So looking at now soil nitrates, so these are nitrates, this is not water, um, and uh, you see some uh, quite a bit of variability over time, so we see a spike here, this would be with the conventional, so again we're seeing that organic matter, 
getting uh, <coughs> mineralized over to nitrate and see that spike there in uh, midsummer of 2009. We didn't see that with a minimal tilt. We did see a little bit later spike with a minimal tilt. Um, <coughs> may have been somewhat related to uh, maybe some extra that got on that here. And then Again, in uh, 2010, because that crop was uh, reseeded, it had been sprayed up around up again, we see that spike. So, um, again, some of these really practical kind of conditions that occur, uh, we were able to, to demonstrate and catch what's going on with those. And then in 2010, we saw uh, in the fall then a bit of a, uh, a spike there in both, uh, both of the halves of the field. So this is an average, and this is groundwater nitrate, shallow groundwater nitrate. So from, um, and this is that period prior to when the experiment was run, we were uh, dropping it below that 10 MCL, and we got it down uh, actually below five. So we go in, we've got um, the reestablishment of seed, the seeding here, and then we got a reestablishment again here in 2010. So again, we see that movement of uh, the shallow uh, of groundwater, uh, excuse me, of, of nitrate in, in soil and movement into that shallow groundwater. We weren't able to actually tweak out any differences due to minimal till uh, versus uh, conventional till in relationship to the shallow groundwater, even though we were able to show some differences there. Uh, as we looked at it in this previous slide, we saw some of the differences in, in soil nitrate but they weren't showing up necessarily in uh, groundwater nitrate, so um, therefore we had the average. Of, and part of that's due to some soft oxygen conditions in some of these wells that um, made it a little more difficult to interpret the data. So in summary, um, we found that there was no evidence for a difference in groundwater nitrate due to the tillage treatment. In this particular case, we did see a, a, a bump in that groundwater nitrate. Um, so we were hoping that with the minimal tillage, we might have been able to see uh, a reduction in movement of nitrate, but again, we had two years of uh, where it had to be, where it was, well, the producer chose for it to be tilled. Um, second bullet point, the results from this case study indicated that the type of tillage did have an impact on the timing of increases in soil nitrate, so that's important to keep in mind. <clears throat> so I think we probably want to continue to do these practices in the spring versus in the fall. And then, um, even though we were able to show some of these differences in the soil nitrate uh, due to the variability in the nitrification conditions in some of these monitoring wells, uh, it did obscure some of the comparison of the groundwater nitrate effects for the two management practices. So with that, I'll take some questions um, from the audience. So, and uh, co-author um, and collaborators here, Mark Carey with the Department of Ecology, so Mark's uh, available to answer any questions that I can handle that might relate to some of the groundwater nitrate. So, questions? Jay, got to have at least one. No? Hey. David. Did we follow the groundwater any further in 2011? Nope, money ran out. But we're at actually submitted a project. The producer's going to turn us into corn. We'd really like to know what happens when it goes into corn. But uh, so far, nobody's willing to spend the bucks for that. And we still think it's a really valuable, a very common practice in Western Washington. We'd really like to know what happens when that goes into corn. At least right now, nobody's want to put bucks on the table. Was nitrogen applied from 2006 to 2008 or 9 there, where it starts to go up? So the question was, was uh, nitrogen applied between 2008 and 2009 um, on this field? Yeah, it's a commercial dairy farm, so there was nitrogen continuing to go on during that time. Um, so yeah, and then we actually, I didn't include that in this report that we reported previously, but yeah, there was, was nitrogen going on. And when we can get nitrogen on at about crop uptake, <clears throat> we seem to be um, minimizing the impact on shallow groundwater. Just arguing that that application is really important. Then the other yeah, really practical outcome of it is and most producers or um, inspectors that are in the audience would say, well, yeah, duh. But the longer you can do, you know, whatever you can do to keep these grass stands in production, high, high levels of production before you have to rip them out, is going to be protective of the shallow groundwater nitrate. So 
if anything we can do to just keep these things going, keep these stands alive, uh, less impact it's going to have. So, Jay and Nicole, any questions? Don't understand some shaking your head back there. Okay. So you make a comment about keeping the grass stands in for a long time. Yep. Then there was a Dutch study that we looked at short rotation of grass, and there were like a kind of year grass. The way to minimize your organic energy will look by watching that. So that might be another system to consider. I, I don't know of any work where they've actually, I've looked at it, and maybe, maybe the Dutch have got some, so the idea would be that you get a, a couple of years of, of the grass thing going to corn. Yeah, that, and that you might be able to capture some of it that way. Um, in our area, most people are trying to maintain those stands for as long as they can, because <clears throat> it is costly to, to reestablish them. Any other questions? I need to smile pretty, Leslie. Yeah. Question here? I'm just curious how um, that rainfall. Yeah, the question was the amount of rainfall. Yeah, we, we do have it on this. We're, we're typically in a between 40 and 50 inch rainfall in this particular area. But yeah, again, for the sake of time, I didn't include it. We also have soil temperatures on this. So these soil temperatures are very typical of what Barton was showing for the Abbot, Abbotsford or BC area. <clears throat> We're seeing pretty active uh, uh, conversion of organic matter into nitrate. 